And Francine joins us live now from London for a panel discussion on unleashing the power of the green consumer. The speakers will be Tak Ninami, President and Chief Executive Officer of Suntory Holdings Limited, and Joey Zwillinger, co-founder and co-executive officer of Allbirds. The moderator, of course, is Francine Lacroix, anchor of Bloomberg Television. Francine, all yours. Wonderful. We have 25 minutes, and thank you, Carol, to talk about unleashing the green power. Now, consumers, of course, as you just heard from Alan Job, are increasingly demanding green products and services. These buyers are often young and politically active, and they also hold companies that fall short on sustainability to account not just through their wallets, but with online activism and green shaming. Now, pressure to adopt more sustainable supply chains, production methods, and business practices comes from activist governments and shareholders, but consumers more and more hold the real power uh, by rewarding or punishing companies through spending decisions and their voices. So we have 25 minutes and we have a great panel uh, coming up. We'll try to explore this emerging powerful force. And I also have a great poll for everyone. So Takeshi Ninami, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Centauri Holdings joins me and Joey Zwillinger, uh, co-founder and co-chief executive of Allbirds. Thank you both. Let's start with a poll. Nice and early, we get off of the poll, which is basically how important, and I'm asking everyone that's joining us to answer this, how important is sustainability when you're shopping? Now, this is multiple choice. A, it is important, but there needs to be better labeling and consistent standards. B, extremely important. I only buy green and local. C, I care about it but COVID has me reassessing these priorities, or D, it doesn't matter to me at all. Joey, let's get it off with you. Whilst people are voting, and then we'll see the results of the polling uh, shortly online, has consumer behavior changed? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we Tim, my co-founder and myself, started Allbirds in 2015. And, I, you know, I think back then I would have answered that there is, th there is nine different answers to the question of sustainability for nine different people. When you when you ask them on the street, and and most of them say they want to do the right thing and that they care about it when they purchase something, but when it comes time to shelling out dollars or euros or pounds in that from their wallet, uh, you know when it's at the point of sale, it tends to go out the window, and they really focus on the attributes that they care about for that product, and and so so we always had the mantra: we got to make great products, not sustainable ones. I think what we've learned in the last five years in in the fast and very rapid consumer shift is that truly great products are sustainable and consumers are starting to recognize and recognize that and and only considering products for purchase that are actually meet, meeting their values and have some sustainability credibility at least at least to a certain degree and and I think consumers are quite trusting of what brands say uh, for right or wrong so they'll, they'll take the, the good the brands the benefit of the doubt. Dak, what does sustainability mean to you? So you're in a slightly different sector. So it, it has a lot to do with the packaging. I mean, are, are people as aware about sustainability in the drinks business as you know consumer products? Yes, Francine. Um, consumers uh, think that uh, you know um, trustworthiness of the uh, corporation is uh, so important nowadays, and uh, we have to be so. Uh, uh, are transparent about uh, what we are doing, whether good or bad, uh, to be honest to consumers about the sustainability, because uh, they want to see what we are doing really and uh, what we'll be doing against our commitments. For example, we have uh, set the three goals, uh, you know, carbon neutral by 2050 and net uh, uh, water by 2050, as well as the uh, plastic um, to other the uh, bioplastics, I mean sustainable uh, plastics by 2030. So our consumers are keen to know what we are doing. Um, so this matters a lot. Uh, but Tak, do you see it directly actually reflect on some of your sales, or because it's that little bit more removed, you're you're trying to do the good thing by recycling, you're trying to do the good thing by doing things, but you don't see a direct consumer like Joey would, for example. Yes, a little by little, but the current uh, uh, awareness of the consumers has been accelerated by COVID-19, as a matter of fact, for younger generations in Japan and in Asia as well. 
Having said that, uh, there is still a stumbling block for them to uh, purchase a father. That is uh, affordability to younger generations because um, uh, I think uh, environmental friendly products are rather expensive. But uh, they want to buy from uh, those uh, making lots of efforts uh, toward the uh, sustain sustainability. So mindset has been clearly, clearly changing as uh, Joe mentioned about. Yeah, Joe, why do you think this has changed? I mean, you, you know, you said what surprised you since you launched Allbirds that, you, I mean, you always wanted to do a good products and those products in your eyes weren't necessarily sustainable. But what do you think has changed in the rhetoric that it seems like now, you know, 60%, 70% of consumers just care much more about sustainability, ready to even spend more? Yeah, I think the the recognition that climate change is upon us uh, i think i think all of the external uh, elements that we face you know i'm in california and we've suffered with wildfires there's hurricanes i think i think people recognize that climate change is upon us and that the next five years are going to make or break the next couple hundred years for for our species and i, I really do sense that people want to do the right thing and by and large consumers globally and, and we have a global business um just like talk and we're, we're we're seeing consumers react differently to what we're doing in China, Japan, Korea, in North America and Europe. But universally, there is uh, an overwhelming change where consumers care a lot more about this issue. I think it's still extremely confusing, though. And, you know, you know Alan, uh, in the previous segment was from Unilever, was talking about labeling carbon on their products. That's something that we've we've already done. We've, we've started doing that for every single one of our products. And we believe that clearing the air of, of the confusion of what sustainability means and trying to allow people a lens into what is the most important problem. And if you're going to stop climate change while you're making products, you have to be accountable to the carbon pollution that you're emitting in the manufacture and use of that product. And so we, we've decided to go, we're, 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 we're carbon neutral as of last year in 2019. Uh, and, and we're working on getting our our product footprint down to zero as well, and in the meantime, doing offsets. But that labeling adds accountability. And, and you know, to your earlier question, um, to Alan as well, it, it does it does drive change in the industry. And I think when, once we clear up some of the confusion on what is what is carbon footprint even mean, and it's an extremely confusing topic, I think we'll start to see even more progress. So that that's what's what's really encouraging to me. Joey, what's your biggest challenge? So when you look at pricing and, you know, Tak was saying, especially in the past, it was considered a higher price. So how much do you need to work at pricing to make sure that it's accessible and affordable? But how much also, you know, is it about um, just making the product? So you're going to close find clothing that is good so the fibers are good but i guess they're recyclable that they're carbon neutral like how much innovation and time do you need to spend on that that's extraordinarily difficult and it's it's you've honed in on our biggest challenge so let me do it maybe by just giving you a story when we uh when we started the company in 2015 we thought we had a a, a great sustainability story but we knew we had a, a very significant weakness which was the sole of the shoe and, and the foam on the bottom of sneakers, it's the most ubiquitous component in the entire sneaker industry, which is, you know, in the U.S., it's about $50 billion. So it's a very large globally. It's, it's probably upwards of, of 200. Uh, and, and this product is made from petroleum. It's made from either natural gas or petroleum. And it's, it's, it's a devastating impact on the planet. So we flew down to Brazil and, and convinced a renewable chemicals company to take the residue from sugarcane production um, go through a number of different chemical engineering steps and turn it into this foam, which became carbon negative. So it actually sucked out more carbon from the atmosphere during the manufacture of this component than it took to create it. So it's better that it's there in the earth than, than, than if it hadn't been produced at all. And then we open sourced that product to the industry to drive down cost of the component. And because there's that altruistic benefit that it's, it's such a good component and it's so widely used, but that took three years. And, and, you know, there's, there is a perceptible difference and it's a very high quality product, but we are also marketing the fact that this is better for the planet and we're trying to do the right thing. And that's very difficult when on the alternative, what we could do is do something that's a little bit cheaper and a little bit quicker to market relying on fossil fuels. And, and that is what the industry has fallen back on. 
And so convincing a supply chain to work with you through all of this, they sometimes look at you like you have three eyes when you ask them to do something that's more sustainable, even if the cost is slightly increased. Um, and maybe I'll just close, you know, we've connected this innovation model to, to our, our distribution strategy. So we do not rely on wholesale players and that allows us to control the pace of our product releases and control what we, what we say to consumers and control our pricing. So we don't have leakage on, on discounts at our at, at wholesale partners or whatnot. So you have to go to allbirds.com. You have to go to our physical retail stores. And that allows us to, to work with that slow, slower innovation process to make it kind of the slow fashion that's green versus the typical fast fashion. Um, Tag, talk to me about some of the innovation that you're doing, for example, in recycling. So um, plastic, which you know many people say is just bad for the environment, you believe that if it's recycled properly, and I don't know whether that's through centers, whether it's chief executives that need to take care of that, or whether it's governments that should take the burden, but if you recycle plastic, you say it's not that bad. Well, right. One thing uh, I want to make clear is that the, uh, you know, Francine, do you remember the uh, Davos session? At that time, uh, the world was uh, so critical of uh, plastic use. And, uh, you know, people were talking, uh, let's get rid of the uh, plastics. But uh, take a look at the uh, face seals, take a look at the uh, partitions uh, made up from uh, plastics. Uh, so plastics uh, kind of, you know, gets rid of uh, 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 some risks. Uh, uh, from uh, infection of the pandemic, for example. So what we are now working on uh, is the uh, to build a plant uh, to produce uh, plastics uh, from uh, biochips, from uh, recycled uh, plastics uh, to produce uh, new plastics. So we should reduce more plastics for sure. And plus uh, we recycle, I mean, which is an ecosystem. Uh, then uh, we are now asking, uh, you know, lots of uh, companies to uh, support our effort to build a plant to um, uh, convert the used plastics to um, chemical components to make plastics. That technology matters, and we invested to that technology. And uh, this costs a lot, as a matter of fact. That's why we need more support from. Uh, industry partners and the partnering is very important and uh, that reduces uh, CO2 emissions too and uh, we are talking to the uh, public uh, plus one thing uh, which is uh, very important which is a qualitative uh, plus factor which is a uh, huge huge support from our own people and uh, their families they are so proud of uh, what we are doing to reduce plastics as well as uh, to order the uh, sustainable plastic uh, you know bottles uh, for us to use for beverages. So I think uh, technology matters first, that cost, but uh, we can share with the industry partners. Even, uh, you know, we are bringing uh, some competitors to our camp because this is not turf for us to, you know, compete, for example, in Asia, because uh, there, are, there are so many issues like uh, ocean littering, you know, uh, lots of uh, plastic waste. So this is, creates a lot of fans to our products and uh, our you know company not only the uh, you know consumers but also families and uh, employees and uh, we need a kind of standardized rules so i think uh, that's uh, the, the the discussion we have to do how much pressure can you put on government so you know in my household we recycle but I don't know what that recycling bin or trash then goes to. How much pressure attack do you need to put on governments, you know, in Japan, in wherever you sell your products to make sure that they recycle your products? H how much leverage can chief executives have? Well, I have leverage to invest to um, uh, technology and uh, uh, build a plant. Uh, I, I would say a huge... Uh, pressure from uh, consumers and society, and uh, that represents a voice from uh, local governments, not only in Japan, but also Asian countries. Younger generations have a huge voice to the governments. But uh, I think a certain level we need uh, is the uh, regulation in locals, you know, uh, from local governments. But uh, 
I think we have to communicate with the civil uh, societies and uh, governments to discuss what kind of rules we should have and what kind of regulations we, ha we should have. But uh, as a chief executive, we, I have to decide what uh, you know, directions we should take. But uh, based on discussions and negotiations whatsoever with the civil societies, including uh, NPO, NGOs, and the local governments, which represent voices of uh, more or less the younger generations. Joey, uh, going back to what you were saying about sharing technology, how many companies that, you know, I don't know if what you want to call them rivals or peers, but how many, you know, are happy to share their technology with you? Like, is there an international body where all of this research and development can be shared? I think it's, it gets dicey when you're talking about uh, true competitors sharing technology uh, to, to actually have regulatory intervention in that. You, you know, we're, I think there's a lot of collaboration that can be done and you need to be thoughtful about where that happens in the value chain. If it's at the chemical building block stage, you know, the, the, at the, <clears throat> for the bottles and the packaging that talks using at Centauri, for, for us, that, 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 that far upstream part of the value chain is absolutely uh, acceptable to be shared. There's no proprietary edge that competitors gain from, yeah. from, from those materials. And when, when you're way up that value chain, that's where, that's where you create this value. That's why when I talk about that, that soul unit that we did, why, we, why did we open source that? We're not going to get an edge because uh, we have a, a particular molecule replace that from, from, from uh, petroleum to sugar cane. If we share that, the whole industry does better. We're going to do our magic to it downstream of that and make it into something that is designed well and it adds value to consumers. And that's the role of the consumer products industry. Now, upstream in the chemicals industry, that's where the innovation really needs to happen. That's where the large volumes are. All Allbirds is a drop in the bucket in the footwear industry. There's 20 billion pairs made every year in the footwear industry globally. And, and the, the footwear industry is a drop in the bucket for the chemicals industry. And so and it's, because there's so much capital expenditure at the, at the chemicals level. These facilities are enormous and cost hundreds of millions of dollars or billions. And, and so, you know, you know, if you think that you can do this alone, one company can make all the change. I think you're sorely mistaken. Yet at the same time, getting governments involved in forcing collaboration is, is I, I, th I think that's a, that's a stretch. And so, we, you know, we, t we tried to take it upon ourselves. We have a collaboration with Adidas. Who, who's obviously a competitor of ours, but you know what we what we came to them with, and we said, you know, look, I think running fast is is great, and it's human performance is an aspirational element that we should all strive to be better human beings. But I think we're we're running the wrong race, and if we don't run the race against carbon pollution, uh, we may not be able to run races at all. And so that that element is uh, is what drove us to collaborate with Adidas, and I think that is a, you know between that and the foam product from Sugarcane, I think those are two models that can be beacons for for how to how to think about collaboration and how to think about it without governments intervening. Right. I, can I? Unless we have, yeah, go tech. Yeah, I totally agree with Joe. I mean, Joe, um, we set the standard by with the uh, Coke in Japan. We're, you know, we are number two in Japan, number one Coke. And we worked uh, on uh, making rules, which uh, are very essential for, much for, essential for us to, to recycle, reduce the plastics in our society. We compete with each other very hard. But in this uh, space, we worked, you know, we worked with the uh, Coke to have standardized the rules. There was no intervention from uh, the central government. That was a beautiful story. And uh, because of that, the, the uh, collection rate of uh, uh, plastic uh, bottles in Japan uh, has you know, risen around 80%. So this is industry you know, uh, effort together with the, our competitor. So, so I think this model can be applied to other countries together with the uh, uh, technology. Do you believe, uh, Joey, and then the same question for TAC, that you know, disclosure labeling has to be mandatory? Because sometimes you just don't know what you're looking at. You think something is sustainable, but you worry about greenwashing. You're, you're not exactly sure as a consumer you know, what the hell you're talking about. 
It's a tricky one. Um, <clears throat> it's a tricky one because you can label 50 different things. And, and there's so many aspects of the word sustainability that matter to people, um, you know, ranging from chemical disposal to carbon emissions to water treatment. You know, in, in Suntory's case, water is an extremely significant sustainability issue, um, whereas that's much less of, a, of an issue in, in, in our industry. So what do you choose to label? What do you mandate before you have a box that's filled with all these facts? And so, you, you know, my, my sense is that leaders in the industry, uh, progressive leaders that know what, the, what the, the biggest problem that we're facing as a species are, what, what that problem is, I, our belief is that that's, that's climate change and hence the, the clear indicator of what you're doing to combat climate change in your manufacturing and supply chain is through carbon labeling. So we, we've chosen to do that. We, we hope that that's a beacon. We've seen Unilever make that pledge. We've seen Logitech and some other technology companies make that pledge. We hope a lot more in our industry do it. And it, it's not easy for, for companies with lots of products and, and, and come from a legacy background with wholesale. But I think it's going to be innovation, progressive leadership from great companies that are going to, that are going to rue the day. And, and, and that, that is what will change things. I, I don't think it's going to be mandates. Mm -hmm. I think we have the results of the poll. So let's bring it up and then let's see where people have gone with this. So A, I think it's A that's winning it by 72, 71%. It is important, but there needs to be a better labeling and consistent standards. And Tak, you were talking about, you know, what you've, you've achieved with Coca-Cola. What do you need for, for it to really become even more important and more, more industry-wide in the next two to three years? Do you think the power of the green consumer or increase as such that you'll have to do much more, otherwise you'll lose business. Yeah, that's right. Um, we want to keep the license to operate forever. So that means uh, we have to be progressive toward the uh, uh, transparency. But uh, uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, we want to you know, uh, demonstrate what, you, what we are doing before consumers make a claim to us. So um, I think uh, we definitely need to be much more transparent about uh, the, what we are going to do to have the better world. And then, uh, you know, as a leader of the industry in Japan and in Asia, I'd uh, like to uh, address the issue together with the other competitors. Um, I think uh, consumers uh, want to uh, uh, buy from uh, honest companies. So I think definitely we have to be honest and to gain the trust from society. So uh, each company has their own uh, definition of being honest. I think uh, that will uh, 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 be a big driving force toward the one direction, which will create the standard, I believe. Uh, Joey, you're going into sustainable clothing. How big do you think that market will be, that segment? Um, I, I think, I think um, apparel more... Uh, very significantly, it's it's a it's a purchase where um, it's very uh, expressive of your individuality. So it's a very emotional statement when you wear when you put on a sweater when you put on a shirt. You, you are saying something about yourself, and I think if you can can both look good and and that's the traditional style sense of accomplishment, uh, but also feel good from a values perspective that you're purchasing something that. Is 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 dividending something positive for the environment? That's a big, big growing area of, of consumer trend, and and we're at the very early stages of that. I think when you look at some of the Asian government pledges that have happened recently, Japan and Korea by neutral by 2050, China by 2060, we are at the very forefront of a very massive tidal wave of change in consumer perception on this stuff. And apparel, footwear, I would include in this as well, but it's a very expressive purchase and that really drives this kind of change. Um, and, and maybe if I could just add back to Talk's point, I, I'm, I'm totally in agreement with the, the aspect of authentic leadership. And I think it's important for, for anyone to understand, you know, you know, Gen Z and millennial populations in the United States for sure, but I find this globally, tend to give brands the benefit of the doubt because they know if there's inauthentic leadership and there's, there's statements that are untrue, they will be ferreted out by the media. With information moving at the speed that it is today, brands get called out for doing things that are inauthentic and, and consumers, hence, give them the benefit of the doubt until somebody takes them down. 
and and I think and I think that's that's a generally a good place. Like I'm, I'm not a big fan of cancel culture in general, but it's a great place that we have information flowing so freely that leadership can say something and people give them the benefit of the doubt until it, they're proven wrong. And I think that's that's uh, going to be a really big driving factor in, in our industry going forward. Right. In 15 seconds each, Tak, do you think COVID has actually been an enabler for green consumption because people you know, have realized exactly what's happening in the planet, maybe more time to reflect? Or because people you know, could be a bit, you know, have a, li- a little bit less cash in their pocket, do you think they'll, you know, there's a danger they'll hold back on sustainable products? Tak? Yes, yeah, so definitely. Uh, people sometimes can't afford, but... Uh, they are so concerned about the future of the world, you know, because of the uh, COVID-19, which came out of the result of the uh, hurting the uh, earth and nature. So definitely people are so aware of the importance of uh, sustainable consumption. Uh, so definitely this trend will not uh, end. This is uh, the, the uh, you know, early stage of the uh, journey, definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, just add, on the one hand, you know, a lot of single-use packaging uh, is being consumed in COVID, which is really unfortunate. But I think if we've ever seen a moment in our history where collective global action is necessary to combat something so significant like COVID, the same is true of climate change. And I think we're, we're on to something as a species to get together and, and really uh, get governments and people together to solve something so so tremendous that we have to do. Thank you so much for a great panel. Attack and Joey there, Takeshi Nami from Suntory Holdings and Joey Spillinger from Hallbirds.